Hello, this is Jonathan Freeman. I am the voice of Jafar in Disney's 1992 animated feature of Aladdin. Other various voices you might know me as is Tito Swing on Shining Time Station and Payman on the new series called Hell of a Boss. And I am here to say thank you and introduce you to, and not introduce you, that's the wrong thing to say. And you are watching In Conversation with Amber the Fangirl. Hi guys, Amber here. Welcome back to In Conversation with ATF. My guest today is an actor on Broadway, on camera, and a voiceover actor, and who I actually had the pleasure of meeting in person recently at Liverpool Comic Con. You might know him through his voice work as the voice of Jafar for Disney's Aladdin, and that includes like, the spin-off series, video games, and everything like that. Uh, or you might know him as Tito Swing, uh, the puppeteer and voice for Tito in Shining Time Station, or many other things, like maybe you've heard him in The Hoax, or American Dragon Jake Long, uh, or maybe you've actually seen him on Broadway playing Jafar. I mean, he also played, um, he's also played uh, Grimsby and The Little Mermaid on Broadway or on stage and Cogsworth in Beauty and the Beast on stage as well. I am very thrilled to be talking to Jonathan Freeman. Hello, Amber. Hi. Oh my gosh. How are you today? I'm fine. I, I'm so surprised that people still know about Shining Time Station. Honestly, it's really, I'd say it's its still quite big in, I'd say the Thomas the Tank Engine fandom because of how it brought over uh, Thomas from England to America. Because I know you've got, uh, I think it was Rick Sigelcrow and Britt Allcroft who mainly devised the idea and then brought it. And then Tito was a part of the jukebox band who lived in a jukebox. And of course, you puppeteered him as well as voiced him. So pretty much, I just want to start with Shining Time. Um. W would you say it was hard to puppeteer and voice Tito at the same time? What was it like to work on it? No, I mean, it's physical. You know, puppeteering is physical, whether you're doing hand puppets from, you know, bottom up or marionettes from up above down. It's it's very yeah. physical. But, you know, I was a lot younger then, so um, it didn't seem to bother me much. I I mean, I, you know, it was a good workout. Puppeteering is a is is very good workout. Um, and it, it's interesting too. And when you're puppeteering for television, if you're using, uh, you you have these video, small video screens, and everything is in reverse. Yeah. So it's challenging. It challenges you physically. It challenges your brain. It, you know. Um, but I was working with people, a bunch of people that I'd worked with for a long time on other projects too. And so uh, we did it for about, I think it was six seasons. And it, so it's a, a really, oh, and then we did some additional stuff too. There were, there was, there's actually a wonderful video. I wish I could remember the name of it, but it's just about the jukebox bands. It's just about quote unquote, the little people that live in the jukebox band. And it's done like a documentary, um, a documentary wildlife special or something. I think um, I might know what you're all about. It's so. quite interesting. It, it's quite funny, though. I mean, the reason that I really like doing that particular show so much is that it's just so completely crazy that inside this, you know, the people go into a train station, they put a nickel into a jukebox, and then they cut mm -hmm. to the inside of the jukebox, and you see that nickel coming down, you know, in, in scale, supposedly. Yeah. And then, you know, and Tito... I think that I think the deal was if they asked for a song that they knew, no, if they asked for a song, if the people that put the nickel in asked for a song, uh, I can't remember. It was very complicated. Something like if it was something that he knew, then uh, that they knew they would play it, and if it was something they didn't know, they just play whatever they wanted. Something like that. It was it was completely nuts. Oh, that's Good like nuts. Yeah. I, mean. I found it. It's just called the Jukebox Band and it has uh, four volumes. It was narrated by George Page and it has four volumes A Day in the Life of the Jukebox Band, A Jukebox Lullaby, A Jukebox Story, and A Jukebox Hoedown. Well, George Page is uh -huh. the voice of a lot of, uh, he, he, he voiced a lot of, um, of those wildlife, you know, we're now, now, yeah. now watching the otters as they, enter back into their nests at night and you know he has a very yeah. distinctive voice yeah i love There's a lovely little picture to go with it 
Oh, there we are. There's everybody. There's Brit there. <laughs> Brit, that yeah. is so cool. Oh my gosh, Brit and there's you Brit. with Tito. How do you say his name? Is it is it Tito or Tito? Tito. 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 I don't know. Tito. Tito. <laughs> I was wondering. Is it with yeah, a, Tito. Is it Tito. Yeah. 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 That is really Tito lovely. Stop image. in the United States to say Tito. So it sounds like it could be a D. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and the woman, the other only other woman in that picture is, is named Olga Felgemacher. And oh, I yeah, met her yeah. many, many years before because we worked together at the Bill Baird Marionette Theater in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of connections to, oh, in fact, the, the guy all the way on the end, yeah. on the opposite end for me was Peter Baird, who was the son of Bill Baird, who was a well-known puppeteer. Mm -hmm. That's a long time ago. Honestly, I'm I'm I'm, so, I'm surprised you remember it, honestly, because of how long it was ago. How did you get involved in Shining Time? I would, you know, I really, um, I always liked puppets. When I was a kid, I liked puppets. I already, I always, I remember having puppets all the time and putting on puppet shows. And in fact, at, at one point, my father very kindly built me this really nice puppet stage. And my friend Karen and I used to do very elaborate, very elaborate shows and probably charge a nickel you know, <laughs> at the time. Um, I guess that's the equivalent of five pence. I don't know. I think anyway, so, yeah. That's that. That's it. I mean, I just was always interested in them. And I also took a class. I, I, I was really lucky, privileged, really. I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio in the 1950s. And it was a very fertile time for the arts in Cleveland. And the Cleveland Playhouse, which is one of the most fabulous museums in the world, had these great classes for kids. And I was enrolled at one point in a puppet class with a puppet master named George Latshaw. I think he's known as the Dean of American Puppetry, something like that some title anyway i so i remember learning how to make puppets and build puppets a little bit when i was a kid and i always liked it then i became an actor and uh i was still always interested in puppets and when i moved to new york one of the first jobs that i got was working for the new york marionette theater in central park and then from there whoops then from there i sorry i just bumped the That's thing okay. and then from there i um uh, met someone who was working at the Bill Baird Marionette Theater and I joined that company, which was a, a wonderful, they had a fantastic theater on Barrow Street uh, and a resident company, resident company of puppeteers. And uh, that was really interesting. So I, it just went on from there. I don't know, you know, uh, and I got involved with Olga and then Olga married Craig and Craig and Olga started this company called Flexitune and I was involved with them for a long time. And they really are, were some of the happiest years of my life. They sort of overlapped with other projects I did. Um, in fact, I remember being in, we, we used to shoot that show in Toronto. And I remember being in Toronto shooting it when uh, Aladdin was having some kind of a premiere in, in Florida at Disney World. And I, I had to leave Toronto and go to Florida for about two days and then come right back and finish working on that season um so i don't know a lot of stuff overlaps in one's life as you get older i guess yeah yeah uh, by any chance did you meet ringo Starr or george carlin when you were working on the sure. show? we met them did both you? now i mean a lot of the stuff that they did was cgi because of who that character you know yeah it was tiny um, <laughs> yeah that's right but there were a couple scenes that they had like in the jukebox every now and then they popped into the jukebox and uh, they were both lovely, really lovely. Um, I'm not exactly sure why they switched. I think maybe Ringo just got tired of doing it or something. I don't, it's I really don't. It's because he was even... unavailable, maybe. Yeah, I think. unavailable. And then, unless they, unless George took over first for season three onwards for the American narration, because it was originally Ringo with his, Never a Scouse accent, but saying like American terms for the first few series, and then they switched it to George Carlin uh, for US yeah. audiences. If that's, I think that's correct. Yeah. Maybe I don't know. I I don't know, but it was there. Listen, they were both terrific, and they were both great choices, and it was just a, it was a delightful project to work on. I'm I'm always I'm very proud of, it, but I can't believe that people still remember it or still even. <laughs> Shit, I guess you can still find it online or something, right? All the episodes are on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. All right. A lot more people are just discovering it and stuff. Kids come up to me and they'll say, uh, do you remember the episode where, 
where Tito, like his piano blew up and or something like that. <laughs> and I honestly do not. It's all sort of a wash for me. I mean, rem I remember a little bit about it because, you know, as a puppeteer, um, you not only are, you know, animating the character and doing the voice, but you're also, there's also work like every day, you know, because we built the puppets too. So mm -hmm. all of the puppets that, like, let's say we're doing a segment. I think there was some like Jamaican holiday song or something. So we have to quick go and like make Jamaican costumes and hats and props and palm trees and, you know, whatever yeah. um, for that particular segment. And some of it we do ahead of time, but some of it is done like on site. Like all of a sudden one day someone gets an idea for something and they'll say, John, uh, we need... Um, uh, a puppet sized plate of spaghetti and meatballs. And so I'd go, you know, run off to the work table with these huge work tables and I would get some white yarn and I would find a little plate and I would paint the plate to look like China and I would plop the, the yarn on the plate and then take some styrofoam balls that were very small and dip them in red and brown paint and then put them, you know, glue them on top of the spaghetti and then pour some of the paint all over it so it looks like spaghetti sauce and there you are. Sounds good enough to eat. <laughs> well, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it sounds insane even to be talking, even to be saying, I made a miniature plate. What did you do at work today? I made a plate of spaghetti and meatballs for Tito, you know, I don't know. Oh, really? Yeah, it was made out of styrofoam and yarn. I'm like, okay. <laughs> it was just a great... It was, a, it was always, you know, it's a very, when you're an actor, if you're really enjoying the stuff you're doing, it's a very nice place, place to live because it's like an escape, you know. I did Aladdin on Broadway for eight years and the best thing about that was that, you know, no matter what's going on in the world, you still have to show up every day uh -huh. and go to Agrabah, basically. Pretty much, yeah, and that, um... That pretty much brings us on to our next topic, Aladdin. Now, of course, because you've mentioned Jafar on Broadway, I've got to start with that. What was it like to bring the character to Broadway after voicing him for, like, such a long time? And, of course, not a lot of people, not a lot of voice actors actually uh, reprise their roles as their characters, heck, on, like, West End or Broadway or anything like that. So what was it like what Was it like for you to do that? Was it tricky? Was it, did you, was it, like, Well, supposedly I was the only one who's done it, who's, who's taken their character to another medium mm -hmm. um for sure to broadway um to be honest at first i mean i always thought i always wanted them to do it because you know when i'm when we made the movie of aladdin let me just say that there was no aladdin there was no disney on broadway yet that came yeah. much later so it wasn't even no one even thought about those things and then once they did beauty and the beast and they did little mermaid and i thought I hope that they do Aladdin. Then they did Lion King before they did Aladdin. And I thought, oh, maybe it's not going to happen. Maybe it's too complicated with all the magic and blah, 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 you know. And eventually, you know, they made the decision. And by that time, you know, I, I was getting older and I thought, and when they came to me and said, you know, we'd like to do this in Broadway, we'd like to know that you're interested. I was like, well, yeah, I'm interested, but, you know, my biological clock is ticking too. And... Yeah. It takes a lot of energy. I mean, eight shows a week is a lot. So I eventually made the right decision to do it. But in the beginning, I thought, you know, maybe it's a bad idea. I'll be the only person in the room, except for Alan Menken, who was associated with the original project. And it's going to be different. It's going to be, they're going to bring characters back that, you know, were cut from the film. They're going to bring music back that was cut from the film. They're going to rewrite things. They decided not to have any animals, so there was no tiger, no parrot, no, you know, so they're going to have to recreate Iago as a an assistant, sort of, to Jafar. And mm -hmm. so it was all, you know, I felt like I would be wading into territory that might be too difficult for me. Mm -hmm. But uh, I had a conversation early on with Casey Nicola, the wonderful, wonderful director and choreographer of the show, and he said, you know, you're you have to get out of your own way and so i was like okay <laughs> he convinced me i guess that it was the right thing to do and uh we tried we were out of town for a long time we we're in seattle for a while and then we mm -hmm. were in 
And then he, uh, several years later, we were in Toronto. And then before it came into New York, so it was a long process, you know, before it even got to Broadway, it was probably five years of workshops and readings and, you know, presentations and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and of course, I've got to ask, what was it like to work with Gilbert Gottfried, who we sadly lost, I think, a year ago, just a few days ago, was uh, one year since he passed away. So I was wondering, wow. what was, what's your favourite memory of working with him? Well, every day, really every day was a pleasure. I, when I first met him, I was like, whoa, <laughs> this is a lot. You know, to be in a small recording studio with Gilbert for so much time every day, I thought this is going to be, it's either going to drive me insane or it's going to be hilariously fun. And luckily it was hilariously fun. It's, you know, it's, it's a lot of energy and he's, uh, he was, he's a fantastic guy. I mean, I think that there are, you know, there are people who probably have the wrong idea about Gilbert. So he's just some loud mouth stand up comedian you know he 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 could he can and did say a lot of things that were off color and off script and you know i think offended people occasionally but it was you know and the thing is none of that was really gilbert he was a lovely man married to a lovely woman he has two hilarious kids and yeah you know and until recently we were doing comic cons together and stuff and we yeah. did a we did a documentary together and um we had a we had a very good time together i'm not gonna lie it was really hard losing him yeah Bless. but he, he was kind of a fragile he was kind of fragile health-wise and that's another thing he never you know, he seemed like such a di little dynamo you couldn't imagine in a million years that you would have you know that he'd be a fragile person really but he was and um I guess, and um, so, but it was terrific. I, I don't have one specific memory because it was crazy. Oh, I will, oh no, here's one. When the movie premiered in, it had several premieres, California, you know, uh, Disney Florida, World. Florida, yeah. It was all over New York, it was all over. So when, we, when it premiered in Disney World, they planned for a, um, a parade down Main Street to, uh -huh. you know, and we had to ride on camels and elephants. And um, I was supposed to be on an elephant and, and Gilbert was supposed to be on the camel. Mm -hmm. But he had recently had some surgery and it was a little fragile. And so they said, you know what, you'll be more stable on top of the elephant. So he got to be on the stable elephant that they were going to put me, old man Freeman, on. And so I had to ride the camel. And all, during the entire prayers, I kept saying to him, he was just over there, I kept saying, I'm going to kill you for this. <laughs> As the camel, although it was interesting riding the camel, they don't smell particularly well. And I, I ended up having to throw my clothes out that I wore that day. Oh no! Like mist, like drizzle in the air that night, and I couldn't. It wouldn't. I tried washing them, dry cleaning them. Nothing would happen. No, I couldn't get the smell out. So I finally was just like, "That's okay." <laughs> just a pair of jeans, and you know. <laughs> but anyway, so I remember that that night was pretty hilarious with the elephants and the camels on the parade down Main Street. Um, and other than that, really, I haven't. I don't. I not one. I didn't have one bad incident with Gilbert ever. We never disagreed about anything. We had a good time. There's, you know, what, what, what would you disagree about? We're making a, you know, a fantastic, working on a fantastic animated movie. Yeah. And then, you know, we, we stayed together. We stayed in touch and we did comic cons and special events and. Um, Richmond, yeah. Yeah. And I was working with a, I was working with a good friend, um, somebody that I met uh, when I was working named Ron Suskind, who was uh, working on a project about his son, Owen, who's on the spectrum. <gasps> oh, yeah. I remember. Yeah. You know about that? 
Yeah, I think I do. It's a great book. It's called Life Animated. And um, then we made a documentary that uh, I was in and I took Gilbert one day as my secret weapon to his school. And uh, it's a great documentary too called Life Animated by the same name. Anyway, you can find them. They're on, they're around. Anyway, that, and that was, that was fantastic and educational. And it was just, Gilbert and I just had a brilliant time doing that too. And and that movie was nominated for an Academy Award that year. Oh, we didn't it? win. It was nominated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who did you lose to? I can't remember. I'm gonna have to look this off in a minute. <laughs> but <laughs> but first... I actually can't remember. It was the documentary category that year, though. Oh, I thought you meant Aladdin. Oh, I was like, oh, who would Aladdin have lost to? Oh, no, so no, you're talking no, about no, life no, no. animated. Yeah, life animated. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, um, I, I, I don't think they. I don't think animated movies are. They're not. They're not eligible, are they, for Academy Awards? I don't, Awards? Think, so. I I think, don't think. No, they are. I'm pretty sure they are. Oh. Yeah. Well, not animated. Uh oh. Mm -hmm. Oh, there. You go. <laughs> I found this picture that yesterday. Was, that's Florida. That was. That was the. That was during the same time I was talking about. I thought it might have been. That is such a good picture. I love it. I don't know wow. if you still have your father there or not. I know it's cool in it. I don't mind sending you a copy, um, if you if you'd like one, and you know just a few other things you know I've managed to track down. But oh, I must have it somewhere, Amber. Thank you, but I, you know, I'll contact you if, if I can't find it. But I'm sure I can get it. Some. Did you just find that online? Yeah, someone put it on Twitter. All right. As you said, there Gilbert you Gottfried and Jonathan Freeman visit their old two years at the Disney MGM Studios in 1992. That's right. 92 is when the movie opened. But we started working on it. Well, I started working on January of 91. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Wow. That is so cool. I mean, like, this film has been in our family for a very long time. I mean, heck, we have Aladdin in the Zero's Revenge on the PlayStation 1 downstairs. Mm -hmm. And just and also when it was on the snares, like, my parents used to play it. And this was the early 90s we're talking. So this is just... This has been with us for the longest time. Um, so what made you want to be an actor, Jonathan? Were you going to go for another career path or what made you want to be an actor? What made you go into acting? Well, when I was a kid, my, uh, again, growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, it seems weird to think that there it would be such a cultural hotbed, but it was in the 50s and into the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, my grandparents on my mother's side and my mother... And my father were uh, they they went to a lot of theater, and um, I guess I think I I think I at a, at a young age like the age of about eight I saw a children's show that was a, a touring children's show or something that was at my school, and I said to my mother or my father I think I'd like to do that it looks like fun or something you know, and like I was literally like enrolled the next day, I think. <laughs> they probably were looking for something, you know, to get me out of the house anyway. And I, I, I don't know, Amber, I, you know, I started doing that as a kid and I worked in children's theater in Cleveland. I, uh, the Cleveland Playhouse was there. Um, there was a theater that every show that left New York and Broadway, you know, at the time they would go on tour, usually with the original company. And, and we saw all the original touring shows of big fancy musicals. And it was, it was great. I mean, I, you know, I just, I just kept doing it, you know, all throughout primary school, junior high school, high school, that's what they call it in the United States. And, and then, um, and I never, I, I really never stopped. I did sort of semi-professional stuff when I got to be a teenager in, in Cleveland, in addition to the other stuff I was doing. And I went to school to study acting. And um, then I moved to New York, put my dog in the car and moved to New York. And because I had friends that were here already and family members here. And mm -hmm. there was just sort of no question. I, I kind of knew what I liked early on and I just kept doing it. I, yeah. I can't ever remember wanting to do anything else. And um, and then, you know, I found out that my puppetry came in handy and all these other skills that I had learned along the way, everything kind of came in handy. I, I The only at one point when I was at university, I got very interested in theater design and I thought 
I, I, I almost con I considered switching, moving into set and costume design, but I, but I, I, I couldn't, I don't know, somehow, I guess I miss performing. I don't know. I don't really know what changed my mind about it. I took a lot of design classes, however. So. Wow, that's so cool. And um, my final question to you is just real quick, because I know in like five minutes we're going to get cut off. Um, <laughs> but um, what was it yeah. like uh, to work on Hell of a Boss? That I oh, well, I just to... started, you know, I just started uh, the first episode of this, of the new season. And um, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot different than working for Disney. First of all, when I started in 1991, when I started working on Aladdin, don't forget yeah. there was no phone patching, none of this existed. So I literally had to get on an airplane every time they needed me in LA and go to LA for, you know, between two and five days and uh, then come back to New York. Or at one point I was working in Houston and one point I was working in La Jolla and they would fl fly me up on my days off to go work in the studio during that period of nine, you know, 91 to the fall of 92. So none of this, it wasn't easy. In other words, it was a little bit more difficult to do. So um, wait, what was your question? It was just what, what was it like working on Hell of a Boss? Oh, right. I got off track. So it's I all right. That because I'm comparing it to Hell of a Boss. So now it's like all electronic. It's all very kind of fast and furious and... I went into the studio like for one day and I did payments scenes and also Buxo scene. I did everything, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I think it's actually, it was still during the pandemic. So um, it was a good thing. It was an easy thing to do because you could just go into a studio and close the door and you were alone. Yeah. And, um, no worries. So yeah. I, that's how it was. It was very fast and furious. And I, uh, Vivian Madreno, who does those, who does that series, she has another one too called um, Husband Hotel. Yes, Husband Hotel. And they're very funny. They're very edgy. They're, you know, they're not for young kids, obviously, but right. a lot of fun, you know. And yeah. it, again, it's fast and furious. It's not very, it's not, it's not, it's not the same kind of work when I w was working on. Disney feature animated movie. It's a little different. Yeah. But it's still yeah. Fun. yeah, for sure. Wow, that sounds so cool. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining me for a little chat. I really do appreciate it. I know you're such a busy man with like your work and everything like that, but just to take the time out of your day to talk to me was just really special. Thank you so much. Amber, it was a great pleasure. Thank you. You're a wonderful interviewer. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Where where can we find you on the internet? Have you got any social media? Have you got a website? Well, Instagram, mm -hmm. yes, you can find me on Instagram, okay. and that's it. I'm, okay. I'm not, I'm not very techno. That's okay. <laughs> that's completely okay. You can, you can always find me there. Okay. Well, I will link that in the description below. And to you at home, thank you so much for watching this episode of In Conversation with ATF, featuring the lovely Jonathan Freeman. Um, Thank you for watching. Yes, I've, I know I've said that once, but I deserve to say it twice. Um, be happy, be kind to yourself and to others. And don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you around. Take care, everybody. Bye. And <laughs> there we go. <laughs>